Uh, all right, so uh, the paper I'm going to be talking about is called CRISPR-Cas9 Mediated Gene Editing in Human Trichonuclear Zygotes, uh, but basically just about an attempt to genetically engineer human embryos. Uh, so what the researchers uh, in this paper did basically is they tried to, as I said, genetically engineer uh, some embryos using this system called CRISPR-Cas9, which we'll talk about in just a second, uh, in an attempt to create what are called designer babies. And they're trying to identify problems with using this system you know, in the future that we're going to have to solve if we want to create designer babies. Uh, now this term designer babies, I just mentioned it, Sydney mentioned it. If you haven't heard that term before, uh, it's basically just a term used uh, to describe genetically engineered babies uh, that have been you know, altered to give them a more favorable traits or something like that. Uh, and really, up until now, uh, you know, designer babies have only existed in the realm of science fiction. Uh, but this, this paper sort of represents the first step uh, towards that science fiction becoming like a reality. So uh, the system CRISPR-Cas9 that I mentioned, uh, the way it works, there's two main components. Uh, the CRISPR protein, uh, right, this green thing here, and the guide RNA, the gRNA, right here. So the guide RNA uh, has a, a very specific nucleotide sequence uh, that corresponds to a sequence somewhere in the DNA, like right here. Uh, and it'll actually bind to that sequence in the host genome. So once uh, the guide RNA has found that sequence and has bound to that sequence, like right here, uh, the Cas9 protein will actually cut the DNA, both strands of DNA, uh, and you'll get a cut looking like this. So this is important because by changing the sequence of nucleotides in the guide RNA, the researchers can actually choose specifically where in the genome Cas9 is going to cut. So now once a uh, you know, cut piece of DNA is a problem for the cell, so once the cell identifies that there's been a cut made, it's going to try to repair it. And there's two pathways to repair, uh, either HDR or NHEJ. So NHEJ stands for non-homologous end joining. Basically all that means is the cell takes the two cut ends of DNA and puts them right back together. Uh, the problem with this, though, is that while those two pieces of DNA are cut, um, you can have either nucleotides binding on or other extra nucleotides falling off. Uh, and so you might end up with some mutations, um, which could be harmful to the cell uh, and you know, potentially dangerous. So instead, what the cell can do is called HDR, or homologous recombination directed repair. And what that means is the cell finds um, a similar gene or an extra copy of the gene and uses it as a template to reconstruct um, you know, the cut area and identify if there's been any mutations made. So uh, basically, when, when the researchers are trying to introduce a specific, either a new sequence, a new gene, something like that, what they do is they inject the cell with an extra copy of the gene, of the cut gene, uh, with that you know, mutation already in it. And so that way the cell will use HDR to repair the cut using that extra copy of the gene uh, as a template, and so that the, the, the copy now in the genome will have the same mutations as a template. All right, does everyone understand this, this CRISPR-Cas9 homologous recombination stuff? All right, so the first thing the researchers did, had to do, uh, was choose the guide RNA that they wanted to use in the actual embryos. Uh, they had three potential uh, guide RNAs, G1, G2, and G3. Uh, and to choose between them, they didn't use embryo cells because those are kind of hard to work with and hard to culture. Instead, they used these HEK293T cells, which is just a very common, uh, commonly used cell line that's easy to culture and easy to grow. Uh, the gene that they're going to be looking at in, in all of these experiments is called HBB, or human beta globin, uh, which is just a component of hemoglobin. And there's another gene I'm going to mention called HBD, uh, which is it's related to HBB. It has a very similar sequence. And um, because of that, uh, you know, the cell can use HBD 
as a template for homologous, homologous recombination directed repair. Uh, so these graphs, uh, basically all you need to know about them is that a single solid line means that there's no cut made, so there's no uh, gene editing done, basically. And if you see multiple fainter lines, uh, that means that there is a cut made, so that there is gene editing done. Uh, so just looking at this top graph right here, uh, can anyone tell me which, which of the three guide RNAs look like they actually successfully cut gene? Anyone? One or two? Yeah, one and two, exactly. So guide G1 and G2 uh, were actually able to modify the gene. G3, as you can see, was not. So they kind of just dropped that one. And then to choose between G1 and G2, uh, they looked to see how specific they were. So, uh, you know, they don't want uh, these guide RNAs to be binding to any sites other than the ones that they're specifically trying to modify. So what they did is they chose seven uh, off-target sites, labeled one through seven, uh, that have very similar sequences to the one that they're trying to edit, to look to see uh, if either G1 or G2 would accidentally cause mutations at those sites. So if they're going to be editing sequences in the future, will they have to go through this whole process of like being able to specify like a certain type of guide RNA? Uh, they, they're going to have to identify, um, yeah, a specific, they're, they're going to have to design guide RNAs that will only bind to that sequence, yeah. Um, this is your second presentation, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the G1 and G2, that's the same exact G1 and G2 from the, from the H, the, the ones that modified the HBB gene, yeah. right? The ones on the bottom, which are looking at the similar sequences to HBB. Yep. Okay. And do you know how similar the uh, the two sequences on the bottom were to HBB? Uh, well, they're looking at seven sequences first of all, um, and I don't know offhand exactly how specific how okay. similar they are. Um, but so as you can see, looking at these two graphs, uh, neither G one or G two, for the most part, neither of them. Uh, cause very many mutations outside of uh, HBB. But if, it's kind of hard to see. Uh, there's a little bit of shading here at site 4 for G2, which indicates that there was a little bit of, of uh, modification done there. So they decided just to uh, continue with G1 for that reason. So now they moved on to testing with actual human embryos. Uh, now the embryos they're using uh, come from what are called 3PN, or trichonuclear zygotes. Uh, and so trichonuclear zygotes, basically what happens when an egg cell is fertilized by two sperm cells instead of just one, so it ends up with an extra copy of its DNA. Uh, so if you look in this image, uh, you can kind of see the three different nuclei right here in the middle. Uh, and so these cells, they can live, they can uh, reproduce, they can you know, split and stuff like that, but they can't differentiate into, you know, specialized tissue groups or organs or anything like that, which is sort of important from an ethical uh, standpoint, because it means that these, there's no way that these cells could possibly develop into a full human. So they weren't, they weren't really testing it on actual, you know, human embryos, uh, but just genetically similar embryos. So uh, they did, you know, the CRISPR-Cas9 thing, uh, again, on HBB. And they started with 86 embryos. Of those 86, uh, 28 of them uh, were actually cut by Cas9. Uh, but of those 28, only four were edited with the piece of DNA that the researchers uh, injected. So that means only four of the, of the 28 uh, Cas9 thieved embryos actually uh, acquired the mutations that the researchers are trying to introduce. Uh, another seven of them were edited using uh, HBD, which is that, that similar related gene I mentioned earlier, uh, which is a problem because it means, again, they're not uh, acquiring the specific mutations that researchers are trying to introduce. 
And then the remaining uh, 17 Cas9 cleaved embryos were actually repaired using uh, that non-homologous end joining thing I mentioned earlier, where the cell just sticks the two pieces of DNA back together, which as I mentioned uh, is a problem uh, because that can cause mutations for one thing. And also, again, it means that they're not acquiring uh, the specific mutations that these four are. So this is sort of the, pr the first problem they identified is that the cells uh, weren't always um, using the DNA that the researchers want them to use. Uh, the second problem they identified, they again, they looked at how specific they were, how specific uh, this Cas9 system was. And so they looked at these, these seven uh, sites that they're mentioning here, are the same seven that they talked about you know, here. Uh, and so, uh, what, they're, what they're looking at is basically whether or not this is causing mutations at those sites. Again, same thing as they were looking at before, except this time they're actually sequencing to, to, you know, so they could be more uh, specific. And what they found is that actually, at, uh, in a few of the cases, at these two sites, G1OT4 and G1OT5, uh, you were getting mutations. Now this is again, a problem because they, they don't want, they did not intend uh, to create mutations at those two sites. Uh, and there's always the possibility uh, that these mutations are harmful uh, you know, to the cell. So uh, that's sort of another problem that will have to be addressed. So just to summarize all the data so far, um, it is possible to edit human uh, embryos using this CRISPR-Cas9 system. Uh, but there are some problems that have to be addressed. First of all, is that the cells uh, had trouble, uh, you know, acquiring the, uh, the specific mutations that the researchers were trying to introduce. They didn't always uh, repair their DNA using uh, the DNA that the researchers gave them. And the other problem is that Cas9 uh, has some specificity problems, where it'll cause mutations in sites that the researchers did not intend. Um, which could potentially be harmful to the cell. Uh, so does everyone sort of get the, all the scientific data stuff? Uh, can you go back to the previous slide? What's the red and what's the green there? So uh, red, red basically just represents uh, mutations. So that's different than the original. These are nucleotides that are different than the original uh, sequence that was there. And the green, uh, the green is part of the CRISPR-Cas9 system that I, I was talking about. Uh, it's called the PAM sequence, and basically that's a sequence that the Cas9 actually binds onto and cuts. Okay, I, I just you know I don't know the system that well, so I'm yeah. just trying to figure out um, why are the okay so why are the CRISPR the CRISPR tags on the end I guess why are those all different? Not all different, but why? Are they? Uh, there are multiple different sequences that I think CRISPR that the Cas9 protein uh, will bind to. Do you know how long, so do you, do you know how long the sequence is, how long the sequence is necessary for, um, how long the target of the CRISPR-Cas9 system must be, do they so say? So the sequence uh, that the guide RNA binds to is I think only about 20 nucleotides long. Mm -hmm. And then there's additional, this additional three nucleotide long PAM sequence that the uh, Cas9 protein binds on to. So, if everyone gets a sign, okay. I just have one more question. Is there any um, um, advantages or disadvantages um, when I'm talking about this CRISPR-Cas9 um, editing and sequencing um, in having two sperm? Um, sperm? That was just, um, it was sort of an ethical thing so that the, the embryos don't actually develop into actual humans. But could it cause like any, like, could that um, affect the... I, they didn't mention. I don't think so because, you know, each individual copy of the chromosome is are still the same. But I don't know. Um, so you said that the eggs that are like double spermed, um, like do kind of develop to a certain point. Do you know what point they develop to? Um, I think they can reproduce, but they can't differentiate. So they're all going to be just <laughs> regular, you know, uh, zygotes. So, is the guide RNA that, so if they found a susceptible guide RNA in 
is that specific to just one person, or does that work for everyone? Uh, it would depend, I think, on the, the specific gene you're trying to modify. So I think. Like, G1 could be specific to say if you want your baby to have blue eyes, but then G2 could work if you wanted to have like blonde hair. No, so the guide RNA will, is um, for a sequence that's already in their genome. So you would, you would probably have to look at you know, the sequence that's already there and create a guide RNA that's complementary to that. And then uh, the additional piece of DNA that you inject would then correspond to the gene you're trying to create, basically, the trait you're trying to create. So, uh, you know, aside from all the scientific and, and technical problems, there are some interesting, you know, ethical questions that are raised uh, because, you know, researchers are starting to look into this. Uh, so, like, this, when this paper was released, uh, I caused a lot of controversy in the news uh, because people were, uh, people feel that this, this sort of line of research is kind of unethical, uh, which I think uh, is in part because people are just afraid of, of new things that they don't really understand. Uh, but it's also, there are some legitimate uh, ethical concerns that people have. So some things just to, just to think about and maybe discuss is, uh, you know, how much control should parents actually have over their children's genome? So like, for instance, I think if, uh, you know, someone wanted to use this technology to, say, fix a mutation uh, and prevent their child from suffering from a genetic disease, I think most people would agree that that's okay. But what if uh, you wanted to edit something less essential? What if you wanted to... Uh, you know, improve your child's strength, or speed, or intelligence, memory, uh, or even something purely cosmetic, like uh, eye color or hair color. Uh, you know, should there be a line between uh, what is, you know, actually important to control and things that are just so trivial that we shouldn't really have any control over them? Uh, also, uh, there's the question of, you know, if this technology becomes more commonplace, what will it mean for people who say can't afford to have this done or can't don't have access to the necessary facilities, uh, or even people like us who are born before, uh, you know, this this was really a possibility? Uh, would we become, you know, sort of second class inferior citizens, or would we have to impose some sort of restrictions on? Them? So, if anyone has any thoughts about these or any other ethical things, feel free to talk. About them. Everyone were creating a design baby. I assume that you would pick almost every trait to make your child as perfect as possible. That affect and the diversity of the gene pool. If there's a bunch of perfect people running around, I mean, I, I assume they at some point have similar. Sure. I think that's definitely uh, a problem. That could be a potential problem. Right? And isn't it? Going off of what Chase said, isn't it also kind of messing up with the natural evolutionary process by going there and affecting the uh, DNA and the mutations that wouldn't normally be taking place in like the evolutionary processes? Yes, please. What if this is a mechanism of evolution? What if like evolution's design, part of evolution's design is to generate a intelligent human being capable of non-homologous end joining editing of DNA DNA sequences. Like what if what if this is part of our it's just a piece of our further evolution? Well would we not be evolving everyone would be evolving at such a different rate because of this status of uh, like wealth. Like we would have such a large population that wouldn't be able to evolve. And they would be at a disadvantage. It would be inferior if we created these perfect I mean, certainly, if, if this, okay, we're making a lot of assumptions here, but it's a good question, but yeah, if, if, if you know, wealth allows you to do CRISPR-Cas9, um, and you're able to do this great number of times to a human genome, then yeah, you would theoretically be influencing the rate of mutation in one group of people more than another. It may just be me, but this doesn't concern me all that much. I mean, for potentially the strength of these genetic modifications could be, you know, significant, but they've, they've
they, they've done a few studies, particularly studying the correlation between IQ and long-term success, and there's almost no correlation. Having a higher level of IQ doesn't actually guarantee longer-term success than having a normal IQ. So I think this is kind of ignoring some of not just the epigenetic factors, but also the social factors that lead to people's ability to engage in society. Although I think uh, there are also genetic factors involved in things like confidence or creativity, okay. which will have a lot, uh, you know, a yeah. much bigger effect, I think, on someone's success. So I think it is possible that you could design a child that's more successful. Maxwell. I'm not a scientist, I'm an English teacher. I see the good side of this as this leads to the eradication of genetic diseases like cystic fibrosis and spina bifida. The dark side of this is that it leads to Alice Huxley's brand new world. <laughs> Can you, what, what is Addis Huxley's brave new world for the science people? Genetically designed society to everyone perfectly genetically engineered to seek certain purposes and functions in a perfect world. What was the downside? <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't understand. What's the downside? The absence of freedom. <laughs> Joking, sorry, Keith. I say we try it. <laughs>